there, I want to talk about a couple things that are on my mind. And one is, as I mentioned in a previous video, I'm reading The Genealogy of Morals by Nietzsche. And what is striking to me, or I should say one of the many, many things that are striking to me about this little book, is the accuracy of which Nietzsche describes the unconscious. So listen to this line from the beginning of Essay 2, and Genealogy of Morals has three essays. This is the second one. Forgetfulness is not just a vis inertiae, which is a passive resistance um, to force, as superficial people believe, but it is rather an active ability to suppress, positive in the strongest sense of the word, to shut the doors and windows of consciousness for a while, and not to be bothered by the noise and battle with which our underworld of serviceable organs works with and against each other. A little peace, a little tabula rasa of consciousness to make room for something new. The benefit of active forgetfulness, like a doorkeeper guardian of mental order, rest and etiquette, from which we can immediately see how there could be no happiness, no cheerfulness, no hope, no pride, no present without forgetfulness. Okay, so that's a really great passage. One thing that's interesting to note is the way he sort of looks at, you know, the the um, exchange of, you know, the noise and battle of, this, of the underworld of serviceable organs. So that does really describe the unconscious. You know, you could say that that noise and battle is what occurs in our shadow, let's just say. Um, works with and against each other, so the positive and negative aspects of the unconscious, and you sort of have this um, physics-type language, you know, vis inertiae, uh, as the superficial people believe. And, and, and if you read early psychology, and especially early psychology about the unconscious from, like, this period on, you're, you're going to see, and, and even earlier, like I'm thinking of Ellen Berger's um, History of the Unconscious, you're going to see sort of this energy and ether and <laughs> like those words he like the words Persig uses in um in chapter eight which we just talked about phlogiston you know this kind of conceptualization of early scientific language or, or scientific language from the 19th century as you describe uh mental processes and certainly this this um certainly Freud did that and many of you are going to say, yeah, we already know that Nietzsche was a psychologist who understood fully the role of the unconscious. But still, it's remarkable when you think about it, when you're actually reading the words, that the language is so, it's kind of, I, I mean, I understand it's framed in a 19th century way, but the conceptualization is just, it's not that different from how we conceptualize the, the unconscious now. So it's a description, that, that description, let's just say forgetfulness, of suppressing the combinatorially explosive nature of what enters our consciousness second by second, by forgetting in order to have peace of mind. It's just such a prescient way of describing, for example, the dissociation from reality we have to do every day. Um, and, and, this la and this predated Freud, which is interesting. Forgetting a suppression, he said, which is true, but in this context, it doesn't seem to have the same connotation of what we think of as suppression, uh, which is sort of an unconscious getting rid of things we just don't want to deal with. I mean, I think that, uh, yes, I think it, to some degree he's talking about this, but I think this is also, I think of this is a little bit more like what Phaedrus did with the note cards writing things down so he can forget them. And remember, he describes this process of writing things down so you can put them out of your mind um, with an adage of throwing out old tea to make room for the new. And perhaps this is some variation of the Persigian uh, concept of peace of mind. So I want to veer into that a little bit. It is a spiritual practice, for better or worse, to relinquish the past in order to have that peace of mind. One must only live in the present, the mystics say. So perhaps forgetfulness can be thought of as a spiritual activity in a way. Um, Eckhart Tolle, who I do mention regularly because he represents an example of a sustained mystical experience, so he's a good reference point for how mystical experience manifests. And he said at one point that you should detach emotionally from old photographs. And I don't know if he meant this really literally. I think he was talking more, you need to detach, you know, from what those photographs represent and the, you know, the sadness or the, the um, 
grief or or whatever it, it does, like, like being fixated on the past. But the way he phrased that really kind of bothered me because while I'm a big proponent of meditation and I do believe Buddhism and these mystical traditions exhibit characteristics of a very high quality system of psychology, especially Buddhism, a complete negation of ego and bittersweet emotional connections to the past and hope for the future. I think that, that this kind of this kind of does damage to one's humanity. And maybe that's the goal for some mystics. But, but one reason I prefer Persig's philosophy to almost any out there is that it incorporates the Western linear drive towards manifest improvement. In the evolution, in metaphysics of quality, there's an evolution of static patterns. And he incorporates it with the circular, omnipresent, Eastern cyclical dynamism of the force that always renews. So his metaphor is you're um, in the center of a wheel of a cart that's going somewhere, which is a beautiful metaphor. And that dynamic force is, in, in Persig's philosophy, it's directed towards the top, towards quality. And, and that quality made manifest, analog upon analog, is what makes us the amazing species we have become. So to rob us of past and future, I think, is a little much, uh, especially for us Westerners. Carl Jung said that Westerners can never be true Buddhists, and I think this is true because the, the hierarchy of the individual is, is, is really inherent in, to those of us inhabiting the Judeo-Christian mythos. And this may not so much be the case in the Eastern mythos and psyche, and as Sulpowski demonstrated, the genes for collectivism, for example, tend to be turned on more with, with people from the East and, le and thus less inclined towards, a, towards the transcendence of the individual. He also said they can be uh, turned off or dialed down when an Easterner, like when an Easterner moves to a Western country epigenetically, you know, these genetic configurations, uh, can be dialed down. Nonetheless, in Western culture, this is thousands of years of this loop of environment influencing genes, influencing culture. So just dispense with ego means of dispensing with something that is so deeply embedded in us. That isn't to say, of course, that often dialing down the ego is a good thing, and to learn how to do it helps avoid a lot of frustration. And you can imagine, you know, situations where you, your feelings are hurt or you want to be right. And there's all sorts of situations where dialing down the ego is, is a great, great utility. And being and meditation, incorporating meditation is always good. I mean, I think that if there's one thing we all should be doing or two things or three things, we should be meditating. We should be exercising um, and we should not eat a bunch of crap and maybe get enough sleep, you know, and have some good relationships. But meditation, I think, is as critical to our mental and physical health as these other things. And also ego gets in the way of gumption, of that desired flow state where we, in fact, in the flow state, do lose our ego. Thus the warning person gives us of the ego traps and thus the benefit of peace of mind. Okay, that's enough of that. Now I want to briefly mention Christopher Alexander. So Christopher Alexander is a famous architect who is quite old now, but when he was active, he developed a theory of building in which the purpose was to make buildings alive. And to do that, you kind of have to build them from the bottom up. You kind of have to get a sense of where they need to be in the environment. And he never used drawings at the beginning. There's this one little uh, documentary he does where they go out in the field and they sense where the building should be and they put these little flags. And so he's trying to build from the bottom up organically. And there's a lot of, you know, dynamical systems theory inherent in his work. And all of his buildings begin with a center. And to make something live, it has to begin with a center. It has to begin with a heart. It has to begin with a nucleus, let's just say. And how to determine that center depends on feeling. It depends on quality. So there's this book, he's written several books, he's very prolific, but this is a timeless way of building, which a lot of people really love. A lot of people uh, uh, find this to be his, their favorite book. And this is written in 1979, so I want to read the opening quote of a section called Chapter 2, The Quality Without a Name. There is a central quality, which is the root criterion of life and spirit in a man, a town, a building, or a wilderness. This quality is objective and precise, but it cannot be named. So remember in the last chapter when Persig says that 
you can determine with precision that quality relationship. Okay, so this chapter goes into what quality isn't. He says, and there's examples, you know, close but no cigar. It is never the same because it is all. it always takes its shape from the particular place in which it occurs. And we know that already in Persig, the quality is never the same. Quality is not a thing. It's not a goal. It is something that um, manifests from this pre-intellectual awareness of quality. In one place, it is calm. In another, it is stormy. In one person it is tidy and another it is careless in one house it is light and another dark etc and uh, so he goes into these descriptions of what quality seems like but isn't exactly so he can't really name it and and you notice um, that he goes through this process uh, that, that Persig at one point goes through a process of elimination when trying to define quality so it's very interesting okay so was Alexander influenced by Persig? And the answer is yes, at least a little. So I'm going to read a quote from a book that he wrote, he, which is The Nature of Order. It's probably most, it's a compilation of all his, his work. This is written in the early 2000s, Nature of Order. There's four volumes, and this is from volume one. Armed with the ideas that each center is a multi-leveled field-like phenomenon made of other centers, let us now come back to the idea that each center has a degree of life. And then there's a footnote referencing Persig, which I'm going to read in a second. I, but let me continue a little. I now want to extend this idea and apply it separately and individually to every distinct center in the wholeness of a thing. The degree of life of each center in a given wholeness depends on the degree of life in all the other centers of wholeness. So this is part of his theory. You have to start with the, with the center, and that center has to give birth to other centers. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a fairly involved theory, and I don't fully know it, but I just want to introduce Christopher Alexander because I, I think I'd like to explore his work and maybe share some of that here. Okay, now I'm going to read the Persig uh, footnote. So the footnote, armed with ideas that each center is a multi-level feel like phenomenon, etc. Um, and remember, this is this is mostly these are this is an architectural theory, but it can, but it turns out you can apply it, you know, to just about <laughs> just about anything, like like all good metaphysical theories. The idea that every center has its life make the life of the centers the ultimate primitive of this theory. Okay, so that's like the, um, the proposition of this theory. This is perhaps com comparable to Robert Persig's idea that quality, not substance, is the ultimate primitive. As Persig puts it, quality is supposed to be just a vague French word that tells us what to think about objects. The idea that quality can create objects seems very wrong, but the idea that values create objects gets less and less weird as you get used to it. I'm saying, and then Christopher Alexander says, I'm saying something similar about that which animates the living center, so that quality that can't be named. And that's interesting that um, that I found that quote now, you know, that I found this reference now because we just did chapter eight of Lila, which this is from. So I came across Christopher Alexander a while ago when I saw the most amazing book called Foreshadowing the 21st Century Art, The Color and Geometry of Very Early Turkish Carpets. This was written in 1993. Christopher Alexander went to a lot of trouble to, to curate for himself an extensive collection of early very, and very early antique Turkish carpets. I think some of these are a thousand years old, from what I remember. And he puts them in a book and he puts, them, he puts one carpet here on this side and one carpet here on this side. And he asks us, which one is more like yourself? And invariably, the one that has a center, the one that, that emanates from a center, is the one that people choose. And this question that he asked by comparing the two rugs, which one has, is, is more yourself, which one has more wholeness, um, is a way of saying which one has more quality. And that, of course, reminds us of the famous experiment in Zen in the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, the original experiment, which essay is better? And people always knew, or at least most of the time, knew which essay was better. So let me read just a little bit more from this chapter on um, quality without a name. One last thing. Remember, 
like I said, this is this is uh, about developing an architecture, a living architecture. It is easy to understand why people believe so firmly that there is no single solid basis for the difference between a good building and bad. It happens because the single central quality which makes the difference cannot be named. So this, this book so captivated me before I read Jung, before Piercig, before this whole episode of my intellectual and spiritual evolution. So I'm going to say in retrospect that probably this book was the catalyst. So I hope that made sense, and I will see you next time.